The turn of the 20th century was a transformative time, as the population was expanding and technology was advancing faster than ever before. However, these changes brought challenges. There was fear that food production could not keep up with the growing population, and concern that remnants of the national tensions in Europe that marked the latter half of the 1800s would again lead to war. In Germany, an ambitious Jewish chemist named Fritz Haber solved one of these global problems, but exacerbated the other as he discovered the Haber-Bosch process, a triumph that would save the world from starvation, but tragically prolong World War I by three years and introduce chemical warfare to the world stage. Fritz Haber, Feeding the World and Warfare as a result of global rise in industry and urbanization, the world population steadily grew throughout the 1800s, reaching 1 1.2 billion in 1850, causing fear that future population growth would outpace food production. In 1898, scientist William Crookes called for chemists to solve the problem. Nations stand in deadly peril of not having enough to eat. It is through the laboratory that starvation may ultimately be turned into plenty. Crookes was one of many scientists who recognized that nitrogen is the only way to increase crop yield from the same plot of land. It is an ironic problem. While the air is composed of 78% nitrogen, plants can't use that nitrogen to grow. Plants can only use nitrogen fixed in compounds such as ammonia or nitrate. Farmers had long used guano, manure, and saltpeter from sodium nitrate deposits in Chile to fertilize their crops, but these sources were running low due to high demand. Fritz Haber, working in Berlin, heard Crook's speech and began to wonder how he could incorporate the nitrogen in the air into fertilizer. Haber was the first to demonstrate that at high temperatures, nitrogen and hydrogen in the atmosphere react to form ammonia. However, other leading chemists were fast to refute his calculations and point out that this process only occurs under conditions far too extreme to carry out on a commercial scale. Haber was not disheartened. He continued experimenting with temperatures, pressures, and catalysts. It would be six years of arduous labor until he ultimately triumphed on the third week of March in 1909. The miracle came when Haber used osmium, a rare element, as a catalyst under high temperature and pressure to generate a drip of ammonia. The discovery made Haber so ecstatic that he could only walk in a straight line by following the streetcar tracks. His discovery was handed off to Karl Bosch, who industrialized the process and made the fixation of ammonia profitable on a global scale. The duo had created Brot aus Luft, Brud Out of Air, one of the 20th century's greatest scientific triumphs. Now, 200 million metric tons of synthetic nitrogen fertilizer are produced every year. At Donaldsonville Nitrogen Complex, the largest ammonia producer in the world, 1,600 tons of ammonia come through one pipe every day, a descendant of the fragile trickle Haber witnessed in 1909. Mechanics and equipment and technology used to make that process happen are different than they were when they built those first plants in Germany, but you're still doing the same thing. About one third of all the people on Earth could not survive in the absence of the Haber-Bosch process. I don't know where else we would have come up with a nitrogen source in order to grow what we've needed to support the population growth we've seen. Haber's friend, Max von Lau, described, Haber would go down in history as the man who won bread out of air and achieved a triumph in the service of his nation and all of humanity. In 1912, Haber became the director of the Kaiser's Wilhelm Institute of Physical Chemistry. This was a tremendous personal accomplishment. Few men in the world had been elevated to such a position of power in chemistry. Meanwhile, national tensions were rising and war was imminent. Science for the good of humanity would have to take a break, replaced by patriotic science to support Germany's war effort. Soon after World War I began in 1914, the Allies blocked Germany's access to nitrate deposits, halting Germany's weapon production. The war was in threat of ending less than a year after its beginning. So, Haber, eager to prove his allegiance to his country, began to adapt the Haber-Bosch process from providing fertilizer to feed the world to generating nitrogen compounds to feed Germany's war effort. Germany's ability to literally create explosives from the air allowed the war in Europe to persist long after the Allied blockade. As the stalemate dragged on, Haber promoted poison gases, which could be wielded to force soldiers from trenches and give Germany an advantage. German military leaders were reluctant to accept this, as it violated ethics and international law established at the Hague Conventions, which prohibit the use of poison or poisoned weapons in warfare. However, the lure of the potential Great Triumph was too enticing for the German High Command to resist. 
On April 22, 1915, Fritz Haber gave the command to release 6,000 tanks containing 150 tons of chlorine gas on Allied troops in their trenches at Ypres, Belgium. As a result of the attack, an estimated 10,000 troops were injured and 6,000 soldiers were killed due to the buildup of fluid in their lungs, drowning on dry land. As one soldier described the scene, you could see where men had clawed at their faces and throats, trying to get breath. Some had shot themselves. The horses, still in the stables, cows, chickens, everything, were all dead. Everything, even the insects, were dead. Ypres was the first use of chemical warfare, and its ramifications would change our perception of war forever. The Allies began to develop chemical weapons of their own, exacerbating the tragedy unleashing an ever-escalating chemical arms race that continued throughout the war. Soon after the Battle of Ypres, the tragedy became personal, as Haber's wife, Clara, took her own life in silent protest of her husband's actions against humanity. By mid-1915, Haber was Germany's czar of gas warfare. Chlorine was harder to control, and you couldn't package it easily into an artillery shell, so he was just coming up with ever more toxic chemicals that you could use in new ways as weapons. He began to develop new and more deadly gases, including phosgene and mustard gas. However, since the Allies developed chemical weapons at a similar pace, Haber's efforts never gave Germany the advantage he envisioned. After the war, Haber called the use of mustard gas a fabulous success. But the 650,000 people killed or injured by poison gas on the western front of the war would beg to differ. In hindsight, Haber's most important technological triumph in the war, the German ammonia factories that delivered munitions, did not change the outcome of the war, but prolonged it by three years, piling horror on top of horror. In total, World War I killed 1.7 million Germans and wounded another 4 million, one-tenth of Germany's population. Approximately 40 million people perished in the war. If this hadn't existed, Germany would not have been able to keep fighting for as long as they did been ended much earlier, and more people would have survived. After the war, Haber returned to agricultural research, this time to develop pesticides to further assist crop growth. The most successful pesticide was a toxin called Zyklon A, which was mixed with a strong smelling gas to alert passerby of its presence. In 1918, Haber received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for the synthesis of ammonia from its elements. In his acceptance speech, Haber spoke of its uses in agriculture, but was silent on its uses in war. Haber spent the next 15 years serving as the director of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute until 1933, when Hitler's rise to power led to the purging of Jews from the country. Haber fled his country and died in Switzerland a year later. Fritz Haber's technological triumphs greatly served his nation and the planet. However, they leave a tragic legacy. In a tragic turn of events, in 1941, Hitler's Nazis tinkered with Zyklon A to develop the scentless Zyklon B for use in death camps. A variant of Haber's own invention was used to kill millions of Jews, including much of Haber's extended family. The unbelievable ghastliness of it is, it was used in, in Auschwitz uh, and in the camps. The fact that there is a kind of lineage that goes back to Haber it is a kind of unfathomable tragedy. Haber was the father of chemical warfare, and his decision at the Second Battle of Ypres set a precedent for militaries throughout the 20th century, and chemical weapons are still used in the Middle East today. In 2017, 89 people were killed in a chlorine gas attack in Syria, and the United States has deployed chemical weapons in Iraq as recently as 2004. Even Haber's synthesis of fertilizer leaves a challenging legacy. Overdependence on fertilizer leads to nitrate runoff which creates enormous oceanic dead zones, infiltrates water sources, causes human diseases like blue baby syndrome, and produces nitrous oxide, a potent greenhouse gas. Haber's legacy shaped Germany and the world. His invention saved billions from starvation, but killed millions in war and chemical warfare. There is no discovery that ranks with the Haber-Bosch process in terms of life and death importance for the largest number of people. Haber's work today lives on in the form of molecules of DNA and protein within all of us, and it lives within every gas attack and development in chemical warfare. Haber's legacy teaches us the capacity of science to nourish life and destroy it. It is up to society to determine whether scientific triumphs lead to societal progress or great tragedy.
Thank you.